sponsors, on behalf of everyone in Dagan County, on behalf of uh, our panelists, I'd like to welcome you to our second annual State of Dayton. I just got to tell you, it's a great day to be in Dagan County. Don't you all agree? You know, this is by far our favorite place to ever have an event, and just looking around, you know why. I will say this, though. Two days ago was the first day of spring, and as one of my colleagues said when they got up and got out the door about 4 o'clock this morning, and it was somewhere south of 25 degrees, it didn't feel like spring. So if you could just work on the weather, then we'd have the, the, the geographic area, the facility, and the weather. Uh, could, I know it is spring. We are very excited uh, to be here today and to have this conversation. I'm going to talk a little more about that in just a second because we do want this to be a conversation. And, uh, but I, of course, first want to begin by asking you to join me in thanking our sponsors. This could not be possible without our sponsors. Uh, CenturyLink. <laughs> Energy United. being a good offense, be thinking of the topics that you want to discuss and the things that you have to ask from our panelists. And this is informal. Uh, I would say that if you want to get up and get a coffee refill, our friends from Panera have provided a great breakfast for us this morning, and feel free to get up and get a juice or coffee. Let's make this really informal and just that our conversation. And while we're at it, let's thank our friends from Panera. Okay. <laughs> Before we get started, before we invite Justin up here, I do want to invite a couple of our sponsors up to bring greetings. And so Angela Espinoza from uh, CenturyLink. CenturyLink is a great partner, has been for several years uh, with us in these programs, and we are thrilled to have them here. And please join us. Good morning, everyone. I'm Angela Espinosa. I'm a major account manager for CenturyLink, and I serve the Triad area. CenturyLink's proud to sponsor this event. Uh, we're one of the sponsors for this event, partner with uh, the Business Journal. We uh, believe in events like this. We believe in collaboration and having conversations with a diverse group of people like this to identify needs and to develop action items. We want to be a part of that. We are a local company. We're here locally in the community with local employees serving local business customers. You may not recognize the name CenturyLink. We've changed names over the years. If you know anything, change is the only constant. But um, we've been here local in the community for this long. We are the third largest communications company in the United States. With our acquisition of Quest and Savas, that put us into third position. And um, you all have a, a little brochure on your, your table with a green cloud. Show of hands, how many people have heard of the term cloud computing or cloud technology. It is the buzzword in our industry today. With our acquisition of Savas, um, they are the 800 pound gorilla in that market. Um, we are the Gartner Magic Quadrant for both cloud hosting and uh, data center co-location. And we have 54 data centers across the United States and uh, Europe and Asia. And we uh, have 220,000 route miles of fiber travel on a 100 gigabit network. So we like to say we're a local company with a global reach. Um, I'm here representing um, one of my co-workers today, Cindy Brookshire. She is the major account manager that covers Davie County. Her father passed away, and they're having his memorial service today. So if any of you know and love Cindy, please uh, lift her and her family up in your prayers. I also have one of my peers here, uh, Keith Connors. He's with our retail store in uh, Hickory. He represents our consumer markets group. And, We'd love for you to just come by our table today, ask us any questions you might have about cloud computing or network or anything of that nature. Drop your business card in our box there, and uh, we will have someone get in touch with you with more information. So thank you again for allowing us to partner with you, and uh, we look forward to working with you. Thank you. Now we want to hear 
greetings for another of our sponsors, Energy United, as Terry Brawley knows and anybody in economic development, utility companies are critical partners in the growth of any community, any region. So join me in welcoming Tim Holder, who's Vice President of Economic Development for Energy United. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. I was just talking, somebody said something about it being cold. If this building were heated by Energy United, it might be a little warm. <laughs> um, we appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this, and thank you to the Business Journal for uh, such a great venue and a, a great spot to have this event. Uh, and I see a lot of people in the, in the crowd are appreciative of the partnerships we've had over the years and the, the opportunity to work with the town. David County, we, we do appreciate this opportunity. Look forward to a, a great panel discussion today. Thank you so much. Two things before Justin comes up. First, uh, this is where the moderator usually tells you to turn your cell phone off. I'm not going to do that. I am going to tell you to mute it. But if you want to tweet, Facebook, post anything on social media about uh, the comments our panelists are making today, I would invite you to do that. It's a great opportunity. The second thing is I'm going to ask you if you will take out a business card. At the end of the program, we'll, we'll talk about what to do with that business card. Please join me in welcoming Justin Catanoso to the program. And I, I might add it's also before he gets up here. Uh, Dr. Edwards from Novant Health is going to close the program. Uh, so we'll hear from our other sponsor in just a second. Uh, Justin is the former executive editor of the Business Journal. He is now head of the journalism program at uh, Wake. He does a great job. And as I told you, he's one of the best moderators of any panel you'll ever find. And he does that because he can keep up with the conversation. But he also knows that uh, how to bring you into the conversation. So, Carl, you're sitting up front. Watch out. You better get your question ready. Okay. Good. Justin, got to know Good morning, everyone. Good morning. You know, these are different every, every time. I mean, we do about six or seven of these a year, and, and, and I have sort of a roadmap because I interview all the panelists ahead of time, but I never know if they're going to work. One of these times, they're not going to work. So Doug set me up for failure here today, but I, I'm, I'm going to give it my best shot. We have a really good panel here, and I think we've got a really good discussion for you. You know, when we were here a year ago, the conversation really turned on economic development and workforce training. Healthcare, big topics in this community. You might not be surprised that the topics we're going to talk about today with our panelists are largely the same. These are the issues that affect Davie County and affect the larger triad. We've got folks here that are on the cutting edge of dealing with those issues. I'm going to introduce them real quickly. On my far right, you all know uh, Terry Brawley, who's the president of Davie, Davie County Economic Development. Next is uh, Darren Hartness, who's the superintendent of Davie, Davie County Schools. Now we have Ken Rethmeyer, who's the mayor of Bermuda Run, where we are, and Lynn Rumley, who is the mayor of the town of Coolamy. I want to start the discussion with Terry. And Terry, I want to give us a sense, since the last time we spoke, there's been a lot of optimism in this community. You've had a lot of good news. Some of that good news is in this room. I want this conversation to sort of cover that good news and why this community feels so optimistic. We're also going to dig into what the challenges and what the obstacles are. Terry, where do you see Davie County today? Think about where it was a year ago, how the economy is changing and evolving. Where are we today? Thanks, Justin. And thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, I can never start a conversation without saying thanks to Wayne Thomas for holding on to a vision and creating a facility like this that we can have up in. So I want to personally thank him always. To, I thank Bill Burnett for holding on to that vision, too, and, and never letting the current asset go to the wayside. So uh, the state of Davie County is strong. I do think that uh, we've been very successful in the last year in terms of being able to attract some companies and the attention of the region and the state on us. I want to share with you a report from the state of North Carolina. This is a report that encapsulates 2012 in terms of announcements in communities. Uh, last year, and this is the top 10 list in the state of North Carolina in terms of the largest job announcement, on this list was Ashley Furniture, which was number two in the state of North Carolina. And 
And I can't thank that group enough. As a matter of fact, they're here in this community today. And, and we're hoping for bigger and better things from them. Number one on that list was in Cleveland, North Carolina, at Freightliner, where they, they created 1,200 jobs and just laid them off a couple of weeks ago. I'm claiming first place, I guess, just <laughs> In, in Piedmont, North Carolina, the top 10 announcements by jobs, number one on the list was actually furniture, and number nine on the list was Carolina Precision Plastic. So you had two out of the top 10. When it comes to investments in uh, the Piedmont region, out of the top 10, Ashley Furniture was number four, Ingersoll Rand was number eight on the list. I think the record speaks for itself. We've had a great year. Uh, it's a team sport. I want to thank everybody and all the elected officials. Thank you for your trust and your support. Uh, but citizens too. I, I really think it takes a community. Uh, so many times I'm asked by people, Terry, what can I do to help you? I promise you, every one of you knows someone who knows someone. You may know of an uncle or a friend or a company that would love to find a good place. That's how you help me because we want to do this together and grow a community. Mayor Romley, I want you to pick that up. You, you've got a, a small community. Tell us just a little bit about Kulami. How big is Kulami? And, and, and um, you understand sort of the currents of this overall county. Is Kulami moving in the same direction? Hello? Uh, yeah, we're moving in the same direction. We're just uh, at initial stage of a 60 to $80 million project to renovate, renovate the old Irwin Cotton Mill in Kulami for mixed-use development. Uh, I think we're all operating at a time when uh, it's not totally unlike uh, when Benjamin Duke and William Irwin set out to build the second largest mill in North Carolina. The country was going through a major transition, especially in the South, from agriculture to industry. There was a lot of political upheaval. And uh, so in that context, not everything is easy, but I think uh, people are looking to carve out a new niche in the world market and um, try to develop some sort of economy or economic engine that is not totally exportable. <laughs> so I'd say our mill project is going along the same direction, but it's a long-term project. It's hard, sometimes hard to get our local citizens uh, to realize that even if they're not still alive, that you have to drink big to have something that will last another 50 to 100 years. And that's, just, that's not just a challenge in Kulami. That's a challenge to a lot of cities and try it out as well. So um, it, it's a worthy goal there. Mayor mm. hey, Rathmeyer, you have a different community here for me to run. Where do you see things today? How would you assess, in, in a micro way, the state of Bermuda Run? Well, uh, first, uh, let me uh, thank you all for being here and welcome to the town of Bermuda Run. Parenthetically, the day before yesterday, we received official notification from some efforts that we've been pursuing with the Postal Service. Um, I would say leadership of the Postal Service, but that's an oxymoron. And they have carved out the entire town limits and all of our streets and, and ranges of dresses so that when you put down 421 Orchard Park Drive, Bermuda Run 27006, it is Bermuda Run. And we're working with the GPS companies to ensure that all of our streets and our addresses, to the credit of Heather Hayes and Baptist for helping us stimulate this, we will uh, change the maps, if you but my perspective comes from uh, back to my education. And uh, a guy named Andy Halley who taught me physics. Uh, physics, there's a couple of key components. Uh, potential energy and kinetic energy. And potential energy is what is contained in a body, either a mass or people or a town that's waiting to be released. And it is released because there's a vision about what can be, and through courage and leadership, it's transformed through motivation and velocity 
into kinetic energy. And that's what we see from our perspective of eastern Davie County. And for Bermuda Run, we are blessed to be in a triangle, if you will, of that vortex. At this end, as Terry Raleigh uh, identified, Wayne Thomas saw a vessel, if you will, of the past, the agrarian past. If you'll pardon the pun, the place of utter production. <laughs> But he had a vision for something better than that and has transformed it into a place of utter creativity. So this vessel becomes a place of new thinking. And that's where I think we ought to be focusing our attention. I'll come back to that a bit later. So there's a sense of optimism among your uh, political leaders and your, your economic development chief. This is a community that has a good location. This is a community uh, that um, has infrastructure assets that a lot of rural counties in this state um, would love to have. Um, but this is a community that also has to be mindful of its education system. And I think um, the discussion that I had with, with all of these panelists today, they all point to it. It's one of the most uh, important needs of this community and one of the highest priorities. Darren, help us understand, in, in, a, in a school system with 6,500 students, um, a dozen schools, how do you assess today the state of Davie County Schools? Justin, I would also say thank you for allowing me to serve on this panel this morning, and I want to welcome our Board of Education that's here and some of our staff that are here. Uh, the state of Davie County Schools is very, very good. We are um, excited about the direction that we're going. We spent the last 18 months really talking with people across our community and how we develop a vision for how do we take our school system to the next step. We've been extremely successful in the past, and now we're looking at ways that we can not only be the best in North Carolina, but be a national model. Um, this past year, we had the highest graduation rate that we have recorded since it's been recorded as a four-year cohort graduation rate. And our track record has been one of tremendous success. And it's successful because of what's taking place right now as we sit here. Right now as we sit here, there's 440 teachers that are working with the future of Davie County. And that's where our work takes place. It takes place in our classrooms. And the partnerships that we have in this community have made Davie County schools successful. As you look at... Um, the challenges that we have, and I'm sure Justin, you'll talk about some of those or give us an opportunity to talk about the challenges we face, but in spite of the challenges, our school system has been extremely successful. Just to give you a little data, um, when you look at the student performance in reading and math, as our students leave fifth grade in elementary school, this is how they stack up in the state of North Carolina compared to the other 115 school districts. In fifth grade reading, we're ranked ninth. Fifth grade math, we're grade, ranked 14th. At the end of middle school, in eighth grade reading, we're ranked third. Eighth grade math, we're ranked third. As students are in high school, in algebra one, we're ranked fourth. And in algebra, in, in English one, we're ranked fifth out of 115 school districts. So in spite of the challenges that we face, implementing new curriculum, challenges with funding, you hear a lot in the news lately about um, teacher salaries. Our folks are making it happen. So the future of Davie County Schools is very bright. And uh, as I was in some meetings this week with the governor, the governor understands the importance of education in the future economy of North Carolina. So we're glad to be a part of that. And I want to publicly say first, thank you big time to Terry Brawley for uh, all your hard work in bringing people together in this community. and. Um, some of our new business partners that are here this morning. Gary, we thank you for that. Karen, before I let you go, I want to ask you about graduation rates. Um, what are the graduation rates now? And as you look back, and how do they compare to what they were several years ago? Our current graduation rate is 83.2%. Um, that has increased from the upper 70s, mid-70s a few years ago. So we're above the state average. That's not where we want to be. Uh, we want 100% of our students to graduate from high school because we know the importance of graduation and being successful in the future. Terry, what's the connection here? As you do your job, 
as you have companies looking at this area, as you're going out proactively to recruit, as you're a part of the broader triad region, what's the significance of what's happening in the Davie County schools to your work? Without question, uh, K-12 is the basic building block for economic development. Uh, education is a great equalizer in the world. I think that we all know that. We all have to be seeking new and better ways. The collaboration with, with our K-12 and the community college is a critical thing because we're transforming the workforce. Uh, you can no longer manufacture or do business the way that we all have been used to. Uh, we're in competition with the world. Uh, we're not in competition with our counties next door. So we need the very best and brightest. And we need to some way transform this workforce, even in earlier grades, to understand that people can make a decent living going into manufacturing. Uh, the aviation industry is a great example of that. I mean, with a two-year degree, a lot of those folks are making $70,000 a year at a household income. Uh, we have to continue this uh, collaboration. I think there's an initiative now to move some of the trades back into the school system, which I think is a great thing. I think that uh, this school system did a great job several years back when we had some Keenan fellows that we implanted into our industry today. And they came back and taught the relevance of what we're doing in the workforce today. And again, we're in competition with the world. Whatever we have to do to remove cost out of our <coughs> cost of doing business and give it back to the consumer is what we all have to do. And the soft skills are important too, working as a team, problem solving, and all of those kind of things come in. But having a great school system is a really key piece to Lynn, you've been in this community for 27 years. You're a newcomer, as she likes to say. She's been mayor for three years. You think about the elementary school that you have in your community. You think about what Darren just talked about and, and to the uh, progress that's being made in Davie County Schools. But Terry's putting his finger on something. Are the kids, the young kids, elementary school, middle school, are they interested in the careers, from your view, where they apparently it appears to be where the jobs of the future are? And those are back in manufacturing to a certain degree, but a higher skilled manufacturing than you were certainly uh, accustomed to when you moved here with connection to the textile industry. What's your sense of the young kids in your community and where they'd like to go with their lives? Well, I had a recent uh, opportunity to ask of all the fourth graders and all the fifth graders at Kulamea Elementary uh, about their views of the future and enlist them in planning it. Uh, we did a student visioning project, where, which I think was unique in the country, where we asked each of the fourth graders to write an essay and illustrate it as to what they thought should go in the cotton mill as it gets redeveloped. And the fifth graders actually use their math skills to, to uh, develop floor plans for a business or institution that they thought should go there. When I first, when we first had the assembly, um, I asked a show of the hands in each grade, uh, how many of the students plan to stay in Coolamy after they graduated from high school? Assuming that they did put that on. So I think that, uh, and that was also true in fifth grade. And by the time our kids go to middle school, uh, they leave Kulami with a lot of pride in thinking they're um, Kulami kids, and by the time they get to middle school, they're not. So the connection of our kids to our community and to expanding their, their brains, their outlook, uh, their purview of the world, um, we hope that'll actually get better. Uh, because I think the challenge uh, that we have is trying to keep at least a good, goodly portion of the kids that we spend our taxpayers' money on staying at home and, and being able to have the jobs necessary. I don't, just to be honest, I don't think that in fourth or fifth grade they have any much idea yet of the potential of careers that they could pursue. Um, and I'm sure that gets better later, but I'm not so sure that even in high, the high school kids who cool me have very much of a good idea of what lays up before them and possibilities for occupations. And I, I'd like your perspective on this. You, 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 your background is a good bit different. You, you came here in financial services, you've been in healthcare, 
Um, your sense of, of these uh, younger kids in your community and whether they might have an interest in staying here and whether they're getting what they need from the Davie County Schools. Well, I think it's fair to say that uh, if you look at the demographics of the entire county, uh, which we are a microcosm and uh, a focal point, the demographics are actually working against us. Uh, the average age of our demographics is a point of our older folks that I closely resemble. <laughs> and the challenge is that uh, at the other end of the spectrum to Mayor Rumley's comments and comments that we hear from Darren uh, during our planning session that he did such an excellent job doing in creating a bold vision for education in David County was the idea that we have a serious out-migration problem of young people. And there's where the interdependencies between economic development and the vital efforts that Terry Brawley is doing coupled with creating uh, a patch quilt, if you will, of a picture of a vibrant community of Davie County, a learning county, where we have the blend of industrial support, like Ashley Furniture, and the technology of healthcare, combined with the richness of the Davidson County Community College and our school system, we're building the foundation upon which we can create those opportunities for new jobs to continue to migrate into the county that would stimulate the thinking of young people to say, why do I want to move away when I can make a big difference right where I am today? And that's where I think we've got to be bolder in our thinking. We're limiting ourselves in not being bolder in our thinking and we've got to take the step in that direction. What I wonder is if the thinking hasn't been a certain way for a long time, and that is that this has been a rural community that uh, provided the workforce for a manufacturing-based economy, and anyone above that was going to live in Winston-Salem, or was going to work in Winston-Salem, that this was a bedroom community. You lived here because it was less expensive, and you lived here because you could get a bigger piece of land um, and spread out, but really, your opportunities and your jobs were in the cities. And what you're talking about is changing a dynamic and saying, hey, wait, wait, wait a minute. We are a destination for careers as well. That's a whole different story. Is that something you see, Darren? Is that a challenge that you see? And is that a part of your thinking and changing the paradigm of thought for Davie County? Absolutely. Um, as we went through our strategic planning process this past year, and um, la last year we had a facilities assessment, we had a demographer look at the future population of Davie County over the next 10 years. We saw that primarily the population was flat, but our demographer made a statement that really stuck with me and he said, what you're seeing is an outward migration of 18 to 25 to 29 year olds. It's the curse of a successful school system because you're preparing students to go on to colleges and universities and when they go to college and universities, that's where they meet their spouse, and then they're moving somewhere else. But what we see, like my family, Bill Junker and I have something in common. We married a wonderful young lady from Coolaby, didn't we? Not the same one. <laughs> but, uh, we, we live in Davie County. I live in Davie County today. My wife grew up here, and we're raising our daughters. I have two, two daughters at Davie County High School. We moved here because it's a quality place to live has an excellent reputation for education. And I want my daughters, Lynn, to come back and live here, live near us so that we can enjoy grandchildren one day. But for us to do that, we must continue to invest in our own community. Uh, we see all of the private investments that have been made in Davie County over the past year. We see people coming in with new businesses. We must continue to invest ourselves in our infrastructure, in our schools, to make this a destination. Just. Terry, how hard is this? In this county, that'll be pretty easy, right? Yeah, I think that this speaks to the greater part of just a county. I think that we have a broader vision of just the region. And that is with the economic engines that are going on in downtown Western Salem with regenerative medicine and the medical center and all that brain trust. 
And if you walk downtown Winston-Salem and see all these young folks, it's been a long time since uh, Christine and I were down there. We were down there a couple of years ago. And I went, wow, look what's happening here. And that migration will come this way. I do. I think with the investment of the medical center with $100 million in Bermuda Run there, uh, I think that we have an extremely bright future. We already have a brain trust here. We're just going to have to create those opportunities. Yes, it's going to be hard, but the workforce is key because having that right worker with all those skills is going to be critical for us to be able to attract those folks here. Okay, go ahead. Uh, to follow on on that, if you have an opportunity, there's a, a great website that's out there with uh, it's funded by the uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It's the County Comparisons. And it's a, it's a great tool to take a look with great pride in the progress that David County is making, as Darren and, and uh, Terry have outlined. But there was one thing that picked up on my mind and was really key, and that is a quote from a friend of mine over at the School of Public Health at the Shep Center in Chapel Hill, Tom Ricketts. Research shows the number one factor determining a person's health in the long run is education. And so when you look at that triangle that I began to describe of Ashley Furniture, the West Campus, this facility, and the opportunities of education, we've got an opportunity to create some synergies here that will transform the quality of life to, to even be better than what it is today and give a vision for people to say, this is where I want to come and live. Because I think what we're looking at is an opportunity for regeneration. Uh, it's in the, in the construction business, it's remodeling and going in and taking the facility and making it something new, brighter, cheerful, ready to be received by someone to want to use it. And I think that's what we're in the process of doing. And the, the bolder we are, the more forward thinking we are, the, the more successful we have. No question. One of the things I want to uh, piggyback on a little bit with what Ken said, and I think it's important to keep in mind, is that you've got the two major medical centers in Forsyth County that have invested enormously in this community. So you've got Navant just down the road, and then you have a little bit farther distance away, Wake Forest Baptist, uh, bringing a new hospital to this area. So they're betting on the vision that these folks are trying to carry out. And that is that this will be a destination community, not just a bedroom that this needs to be a full-service community, so we're going to have full-service health care. You're not going to have to drive 15 miles for it. That infrastructure that I mentioned earlier is not just roads and sewer capacity, which is actually something that needs to be dealt with, but it's also those kinds of resources as well. Schools are a big thing. I want to go out into the audience for a second. Where is, um, where is Jim Vanderhees? Jim, I want to put you on the spot because you're a newcomer in town. We're talking about the viability of this community, the um, the, uh, the promise of this community, and you're a guy from the West Coast. Uh, he's the, the, the head of Pro Refrigeration, just announced recently that they're going to be moving uh, their East Coast operation here. They're going to be investing $5 million into a 40,000 square foot space that they're going to own not too long into the future. And they're going to be creating about 85 jobs over the next five years. Jim, why are you here? You have lots of choices, not just in the Southeast, but in North Carolina. What brought you to Davie County? I think everything you talked about. There were a lot of reasons that um, we, we visited 12 different counties, I think, across North Carolina and, and a couple in Virginia. And Terry mentions that the first time we came here, it just felt right. It felt like a good fit. And the more I learned about the county and meeting the different people, um, not only the public but private, um, I was introduced to Mr. Junker and a few people on early on, and, and a lot of times we just showed up unannounced and they would take the time to, to share the community. So it was, uh, I don't know, it was a good fit right from the start. And I think everything we touched about, we, we visited a lot of counties where they would highlight one thing or the other, but here was the whole package. So when you say the whole package, you're talking about uh, cost of doing business, obviously. Sure. You had a building that fit your needs. Yep. Okay, you had the uh, transportation infrastructure in place to get your product out. So you guys make chillers for the uh, beer and wine industry for breweries. Uh -huh. okay. 
Um, but what are the intangibles? So you're a young guy, you've got young families, your wife is here with you. I mean, you're going to live in this community and, and, and have a family here as well. Were those all green lights as well? Absolutely, yeah. And, and I have a board of directors that I report to and couple to. And they're saying, you know, why not Alabama? Why not Arkansas? And the big thing is, yeah, it's a community we want to be a part of and, and that I'm going to be a part of. And, and we factored that in. Um, that was a big part of our decision. Terry, help us, help us understand from your point of view, what did it take to put that deal together? Right person in the right community, I guess. It's a short answer, but really, uh, so much of what we deal with, 95% of every client I deal with are looking for an existing building. And uh, we had the right building, but we also had the right community. And I think that what Davie County is really good about is with one phone call, we had all the elected folks. We had representatives from Raleigh. We had our school superintendent. We had every face card that we needed to talk to Jim and welcome him and have lunch with him. Three days notice. Three days notice and he said, wow, you can do that that quickly? I said, that's what we do. That's what Davie County does. That's what, when, there's a battle cry, there's a phone call made, and people come out. Yesterday, Mr. Wanick texted me, and this was, uh, Wednesday, and he said, I need to meet with your planning staff and your building inspector, and I had about a six-hour notice to do it. We were all there. He said, wow. And I said, what's the beauty of a great uh, community, a small community that we all rally together? But at the end of the day, we really have to have that product. We have to have those buildings that are ready to go. And believe it or not, we're starting to run out of buildings. I think they have three buildings left. And then we're going to have to build new product, Carl. And, and because that, that's what drive building. Uh, Jim will tell you, had that building not been in this community, and we about lost this project a couple times because we had some negotiating issues. Uh, Hickory was a real strong contender for this project, but it was hard work, staying with it, doing what you say you're going to do, what we do in this community and that. So is there the political will in, in this community, whether it's with the town governments or the county government, to invest in, in that kind of speculative construction. What do you think, Terry? You know, we've been blessed, Justin, to do something better than that, and that is we empowered the private sector to do that. We have an industrial park just north of 40 that city, county uh, invested and collaborated with the uh, private sector where we do the infrastructure, road, water, and sewer, and the private sector put the building up and they took the risk. I really don't think it's fair for government to compete with that private sector when there's a will to do that. So we did something that every community is envious. Every rural uh, small community out there would love to have a 100,000 square foot building paid for by the private sector built on speculation. We have that with Joe Hollingsworth. Uh, Joe's not here, but what a collaboration has been. I see I've got some county commissioners here in front of me, and I wonder if I can turn that uh, question to someone who's actually sitting in one of the seats. Carl, could you pick that up? This idea of, of assisting the private community in... Do we have a county commissioner here? Terry. Terry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Carl, we'll come back to you. I wonder how we put the spotlight on the person who's got the authority. From, from the point of view of the county, is this something that the county is interested in doing? This is a risky move, investing in this kind of capacity. As far as investing in infrastructure to create jobs, um, we are certainly cognizant that jobs is critical to grow the county. And, uh, that is some, investing in the infrastructure is certainly something we've talked about. We have some other infrastructure issues throughout the county that is part of a grander plan as far as water and just expanding overall capacity to the county. But uh, I think to what Mr. Brawley said as far as building the buildings, as long as we have an appetite for the private sector to build that, um, I think we would be better off putting our resources to public infrastructure. Interesting. Okay. Ken, this is something you and I talked about a couple days ago in preparation. And one of the 
priorities for you and Green Meter Run is that kind of infrastructure, whether it's water or sewer in the eastern part of the county. What do you see the needs? You know, uh, during our discussion, uh, Justin asked what's the number one impediment for economic growth. Uh, this past 18 months, the town went through an extensive uh, planning business and to create a comprehensive plan. In our most recent uh, planning session with the town council in January, in virtually all of the elements that we're trying to pursue, the, the number one impediment was sewer capacity. But the more I thought about that, uh, it's not sewer capacity. That's a symptom, uh, a deeper issue, and that is a way of thinking. And to Terry's point and some of the other points we've heard, we've got to stop thinking about impediments and start thinking about how do we create. And so our efforts in working with the county are to try to be as aggressive as we can be to turn those impediments into positives so that we can grow. We have the capacity to do so. We're beginning to hear Terry's phones ringing off the hook. Once uh, the Baptist facility and the Novon facility are open, believe me, the transformation is going to be dramatic. So from our, from our perspective, we want the county working with us in finding that capacity so we can grow. We know the growth is there. We know that potential is there. We're going to make it happen. I'm going to come to Darren in a little bit when we're going to talk about an issue that's on top of his priority list, and that is uh, facility needs for the school system. Before we get there, I want to bring Lynn back into the discussion, because I think it's a nice segue to talk a little bit about Irwin Mills. So here you have a, a plant that has been underutilized for a really long time. Um, it's 600,000 square feet. Uh, Reynolds Tobacco had a, had a STEM rate in there, and, uh, and you've got a variety of uses now. You've got this grand vision that you mentioned. This all sort of fits into, can this be a destination? We have so many empty mills in this state, in communities like Davie County, and there are folks eager to renovate them into something that will generate tax base and generate jobs. There are a handful of them that are successful. One of them is in Saxophon Hall, and if any of you have ever been to Saxophon Hall in the mill there, you'll see a, a transformation of a rural community. But they happen to be 20 miles from Chapel Hill, 30 miles from Durham. They have a whole different demographic there that feeds into that place. I'm going to ask a skeptical question. What makes you think you can make Irwin Mills work in Davie County in Coolidge? Well, on a sun Saturday or Sunday afternoon, when it's sunny out and hot, we have people to actually leave like, their homes on Lake Norman because there's too much noise and traffic and come and spend the afternoon at the Bull. So if that can happen, I think there's a craving in society, particularly since the financial meltdown. Uh, people have reevaluated, taken another look at their lives and don't necessarily want a, you know, a huge house. I think they want to live in a somewhat different way. They don't want to be uncomfortable or, or uh, poor. Nobody does. But I think they want to live in an actual community. I think they want to live amidst more uh, amidst nature. And of course, there's some people who are always going to want to live in the city, and that's fine. It has a certain vibrancy that we won't have. We don't yet have one traffic light, so there's some advantages to our situation. Uh, I also think that people are going to come there. They say that uh, in the next 25 years that half, pe half the people will be working at home uh, and telecommuting in their jobs. Uh, this kind of self you're never completely self-reliant or self-sufficient. But an economy, a small economy that's more of that way, I think is appealing to people. And the fact that it has the chance of actually being a community, that is not something that everybody in America can enjoy anymore. Uh, so I think that it's going to be successful uh, because it's a unique destination. We intend to keep it that way. Um, and also because we have a notion most of our folks in Kulami are blue-collar people, and our region has a lot of blue-collar people. Well, how do you get people who have been in old manufacturing to think newly about themselves? Uh, we have fishermen and people who spend time at the river who with a one or two year uh, community college or college 
uh, environmental studies base, they already know all the animals and fish and where they spawn. And, uh, they can be field guides for people from Japan or Europe who want to see this, after all, is the biggest, thickest section of the South. There's a lot of people who don't want to get a tour, a vacation to North Carolina or to the South uh, that don't necessarily want to see Gone with the Wind or a rural mountain holler. They want to see what the South is really like. And the Piedmont of the South is, has been the majority of people since the beginning. So there's, we have people in Kulami who um, would be great at uh, artisans, artisanal skills at redoing uh, old buildings. Uh, I don't think there's an artisanal program for a two-year certificate of how to build the, do the moldings, how to repoint the bricks. I don't think there's one of those programs at a community college in North Carolina. We'd like to be the first to do that. So we have a lot of reasons for being confident. So there's a big vision there for Irwin Mills. It's a big dollar amount too, 60 to 80 million dollars. Terry, you have a different sense, you know, when you and I talked the other day, of what the potential is for that space. What do you think? You know, what I think is exciting, regardless of where you are today, it's right here. Every one of us are connected to the world, right here. You can be in Kuwait, you can be in Singapore, you can be anywhere in the world today, and we're all connected right here. You know, I heard Winstream talk about a data center. What about a data center? They could be anywhere. They really want to be in a remote location. They use a lot of power to them. Um, there, there's a, is there an opportunity? There are call centers today when you're on the phone, and hopefully they're speaking our language. Uh, you know, they're, they're at a destination that you don't know. They're in a remote location. You know, what about a fish hatchery for the state of North Carolina? There's green energy down there. There's a river. Again, like the mayor, uh, Rethmeyer, has said, we have to think boldly and broadly about how we collaborate. So, you know, the, the greatest asset they have going for them is their mayor. I promise you, a labor of love, what she and her husband have done there. And we've come through all kinds of hurdles on the grants. They just got $235,000 in money down there, so we're going through a brownfield study. We're going to have a plan in place that if a developer comes in, Carl, I can show you what you can and cannot do down there. We're going to have all that done so it's going to be bankable, and we're going to be ready to go with it. But uh, I'd bet my money on that community. Where does this money come from? Sixty to eighty million dollars. Where is it? Where is it going to come from? One place it comes from is historic tax credits, okay. which we do not. Which is a loophole that we do not want to go away. <laughs> I'm going to argue for some exception, uh, even though I like the idea of loopholes going away. Uh, in general, when it comes to my loopholes, I don't want. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible without that. With the uh, historic tax credits of 20% uh, from this state and with the mill tax credits and 20 from the federal government, by the end of our design phase in 2014, that it will end up paying for 40% of the renovation costs. That's a pretty big chunk of, Absolutely. of capital. Uh, and of course, other private investments. The town never intends to own it as a, as a, a way to go with it. Our partnership with the David County Economic Development Commission, we wouldn't be where we are without them and the county commissioners and, you know, uh, Julia Howard and, and uh, Senator Brock. But um, I, 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 that's, that's the first start for our project. Okay. So this is a community with, uh, with big aspirations and, and big price tags on those aspirations. Town of Coolamy, not a thousand people. No red lights, no green lights, no lights of any kind. Eighty million dollar project they're trying to get going. And then in the county, we've got a superintendent of schools here that's talking up the idea of a fifty-two million dollar uh, bond issue to build a new high school. Darren, why is that needed? Great question, Justin. Um, this past year, we did a facilities assessment of all of our campuses across Davie County, and we had architects and engineers visit all of our campuses. And we decided, you know, we, we, we asked them, you know, what does this look like over the next 10 years? How do we continue to invest and maintain quality school facilities? And they brought back to us a long-range plan and, 
identified David County High School as the highest need there. And we asked them, when you look at this campus, what can you do to make this a 21st century learning environment? What can you do to help us to establish a vision for the future? And they quickly came back to us after assessing the campus and said, you should no longer continue to invest in this property here. There's 33 acres, you have 1,800 students, you need at least 60 to 80 acres to continue to develop the high school. So they put together a plan. Uh, we hired an architect back in the, in the fall of this past year. And the architect has helped us not to continue to focus on the problem that we have, but we now have a solution. And we have a comprehensive plan for one high school for all of Davie County. This community has been through um, two bond referendums that have failed in the past for two high schools. So this is a solution that we feel like in interviewing our students, our staff, parents, and community that people can embrace. Um, it is one school for all students, all programs on one campus, centrally located in the county. And I hope to take this plan and solution to the county commissioners on April the 1st and ask them to put it on a bond referendum in November so that people in Davie County can decide if this is the best investment for, um, for the future of Davie County. I want to go back just a moment. We, we've provided a solution. So Justin, the solution is there, and we will get out and talk with people about that solution if our commissioners will allow that to be on a ballot. We hope that they will. Um, but investing in education has to be the best place we can put our money. I'm going to go back to my personal experience. I'm the product of two high school dropouts who dropped out of high school in 1969 to have me. And because of their choices, we grew up poor. But I had teachers along the way and in high school who said, Darren, if you want to break this cycle, you need education. You need to get serious about your education in high school. You need to continue your education. Here's some scholarships you should go after. We're going to help you do that. And I continued my education. And it changed my life. It changed the life of my family. It changed the life of my children. When my father passed away in 2001, my mom came to me and says, what do I do? She said, I've been thinking about it. I've taken care of your dad for the past three years. What do I do now? And I said, Mom, I need to go back to school. So in her 50s, my mother went back to school to a community college and got a degree and doubled her salary. And it's because of education that has changed our lives and can change the face of this community. If we don't continue to invest in education, we're doing this community a disservice and we will continue to see our population grow older and young people not come back to the community. So we've provided a solution and we want an opportunity for the people in Davie County to vote on that solution in November and let's move this county forward. You've just heard the first campaign speech for this politician. <laughs> Pretty good one, too. Terry, as you hear from businesses, and this is the devil's advocate, you hear from businesses when they come in here, they go and they visit the schools, maybe they do, maybe they don't. Does anybody ever say, boy, I'd come here if you had a new high school? You know, Justin, the, the question I really get from companies is they're looking for results. They're looking for what Darren talked about earlier in terms of those graduation rates, that skill set that's being graduated out there. Uh, I do make an attempt to go by the schools. I don't know that I've been inside the schools. But uh, that question in terms of, you know, are there new facilities there? I haven't had that question. They're looking more for results. Let me say one thing when it comes to this issue here. I mean, it's, I don't, I've never talked to anyone that's against education. I think one of the, the, the toughest things that counties, and I've been a county manager, you can see the scars here. And, and Jim, you can tell me whether I raised taxes 12 or 13 cents, I don't remember. Uh, but I think every, every dime that we raised uh, while I was county manager, except for one cent, went to education. That's probably why I'm sitting on the bench today. Um, but what I would say to you, what's difficult in this county is not the people that are bad, it's the system that's here. When you deal with ad valorem taxes, and that's the only way that we're given to pay for these things, I used to say it all the time, I taxed you, you pay me one time a year at Christmas and you never forgive me all year long. 
that valorum tax, I promise you, is one of the most despised taxes out there. We need new and better ways to help finance infrastructure in this state. And I know when we implemented new laws, and my real estate friend will fuss at me over this, but when we voted on a land transfer tax as an alternative way to fund that, it went down 75-25. But we as a state need better ways for county commissioners and, and schools to finance infrastructure going forward. Uh, I'm not sure what that solution might be, whether it's a consumption-based tax. I think more people are, are comfortable with that. But that's part of the evil that gets into these discussions, is how do you pay for it? And particularly people that have become senior in years, uh, you know, people here are trying to do the right thing. And they have hit on a solution that I think everyone agrees on. They want one high school. I think this community agrees about that, totally. It's how we go about paying for it. It's hard to get folks to vote themselves a tax increase. Kim, what's your take on this? Well, my take is uh, having been part of the process that Darren led, uh, it was a great opportunity to meet a lot of people that I had not met, but to also hear some very diverse thinking and, and discussion, an open dialogue, uh, probably for the first time in a long time, about what is the critical. And when we meet with our real realtors that we deal with to try to grow our community, the first question that we ask is what are the major impediments? Uh, focusing on young people and their interest in moving to our town. And it's education. What is the accessibility? What is the distance? What's the quality? What's the depth? Et cetera. And we're very proud of the progress that we're making. But this document that uh, Darren has referred to has a very bold vision that Davie County Schools will be a national model. That is not the best in the state. That's the best in the nation. And in order to get there, we've got to organize the resources, organize the motivation, organize the funding, to do whatever it takes to make that come to a reality. Otherwise, we will sub-optimize our performance, we will understate our ability to achieve what we think we can achieve, and the opportunity costs will come back to bite us. So, from our perspective, our town says we want to do whatever we can to make it work. Do we have other ideas as well? Sure, we should have. If we don't, we're not going to be continuing to learn. You know, my parents graduated from high school. They didn't go to college. But when I was growing up in academics, mediocrity and average was a four-letter word. And so, therefore, we're not going to stay with four-letter words that represent mediocrity anywhere. We're going to continue to push. And that's part of our goal. We'll do whatever we can to support our system, our economic development, We've got some people sitting here. Uh, I'm embarrassed by the, the wealth of talent that they have and what they've accomplished and what we still need to do. Darren, you've mentioned a couple of times now, and, and, and Ken just did as well, this idea of being a national model. Uh, explain that. In, in what way can Davy County Schools be a national model? Well, first of all, the most <coughs> important thing that we do is support teachers. Because again, our work takes place in the classroom. So we must first support our teachers. And when you look across North Carolina, and the majority of our funding comes from the state of North Carolina for education, we're different than the majority of the country. When we look at teacher salaries in North Carolina, ranked 46th in the nation. I think it's 48. Okay. Somewhere in there. I won't argue that point, but it's bad. That's not good. <laughs> when you look at someone coming out of college, they'll start out at less than $31,000 a year, and it'll take them 15 years to reach $40,000. You've got a problem, folks. Our priorities are not in the right place. My good friend Mark Edwards, who's the superintendent of Mooresville Graded School District, and I talked some this week. He's the national superintendent of the year. They're doing some great things with one-to-one -one learning in Mooresville Graded School District. Mark told me that his daughter is graduating from UNC Charlotte and she's considering going to teach in Nashville, Tennessee because she can make $10,000 more a year, first year, than she can in North Carolina. He's a national superintendent of the year and I'm sure he'd love to have his daughter teaching in Mooresville. So we must 
continue to invest in education from a state perspective. So I hope that people will keep an eye on that and our legislators will make that a priority. Um, when, it, when you look at funding for North Carolina public schools, we're 48th in the nation. That's not something to be proud of, folks. It's not something to be proud of at all. When we look at reduction of um, money for classroom materials, for textbooks, for digital learning, we have a bold vision. But some of that takes money as well. But investing our teachers is number one. That's how we become a national model. And when you look at the results that we're getting, if North Carolina is one of the lowest funded schools, school systems in America, and Davie County is ranked 105th out of 115 in North Carolina in funding, and that's not because of our local commitment. It's primarily based on we receive very little federal funding because of such a low poverty level, which is a great thing. Don't get me wrong there. And you see the results that we're getting, one of the lowest funded school systems in America, we're getting the results we're getting now. We must continue, though, to have quality teachers, quality classroom resources, and quality facilities. When you walk into a facility, you want to see science labs that are 21st century. You want to see classrooms that are blended models of technology and traditional teaching. All of those things have to come together. And our children and parents want quality educational facilities. When they drop their child off, they want to know that they're receiving a quality education in a wonderful facility like we have in our community colleges and universities across the state. Ken, go ahead. To follow up on that, the, uh, and I will ask Dr. Joel Edwards' indulgence to my uh, perseveration on the West Campus. Uh, but What's going to happen across the road when, in August and the fall, when the West Campus opens at Wake Forest Baptist Health? That will be a major transformation of our environment, just as what is going to happen up on Harbor Road for Clemens. And the essence of that is, if you think about what we're getting, we're not just getting clinical care and clinical services. We're getting a community service that is a learning opportunity, and it will reinforce that value. And in Baptist case, Dr. McConnell and his staff are telling me that we're going to have a hundred new jobs, not just transfers into the area, but new people looking to work in that facility. And they're going to be looking for schools and homes and recreation and buildings and retail to enjoy their life. And it's our job as government to do whatever we can to facilitate that process. If we don't, shame on us. And I'll tell you, that's been our focal point. Notwithstanding the competition, uh, I'm not a believer in the CON, by the way. I think it works against us. But for that purpose, we're going to have two great institutions of health, healing, and palliative care, mostly for those of us who are getting to that age that are going to need that geriatric support. So I'll stop there. All right, we've been at this for about an hour. I have another question for the panel, and I'm going to turn it out to you. We're going to start wrapping up in about the next 15 minutes or so. So uh, those of you that have questions, I'm, I'm going to be uh, looking to call on you soon. The issue has come up about state government and the role of state government as it pertains these kind of communities like Davie County, but also particularly as a campaign uh, pertains to uh, education. We have a $20 billion budget in, in North Carolina that's generated from the tax revenue that we collect across the state. More than 50% of the money that we generate through our tax revenue in this state comes back to education, whether it's public schools, K-12, community colleges, or higher education. This is what North Carolina has staked itself on. This is what we have distinguished ourselves from in the South education, our support for education, not just K-12, community colleges are a national model, our university system is the envy of the world, or at least it had been. We've been cutting the budgets for education in the state for the last five years. We are seeing the results of that. You have a kid who's a teacher, and her father is a superintendent of one of the finest school systems, and she doesn't want to teach in it. That's a problem. So what is the role of state government, from your perspective? Where are we now with that? What kind of message needs to go to Romney? Terry, why don't you start? 
70, 52% of the North Carolina general fund went toward education. Now it's around 30%. If we had that same percentage today as we did in 1970, there'd be almost $3 billion more going into education. So I think it just comes down to a matter of priorities. And we hear a lot about choice, we hear a lot about private schools and vouchers and charters and those kind of things. Throughout all this, and I tell our staff this, bottom line is we have 6,500 children to educate. We have 440 teachers to take care of and to provide them the resources that they need. Regardless of what happens in Raleigh or in Washington, we must take care of Dady County. So um, I feel like our teachers feel like they're under assault by some politicians in, in, in a lot of ways. And all of us in this room, if I ask you the one question, who was your favorite teacher? There was someone in your life that was one of your teachers who made an impact on your life. And until we value educators like we see in Finland, Singapore, and other places that have, have successful education models, until we value teachers and show that we value them and treat them as professionals, we won't reform education. Let's turn this out here. Let's have some questions from the audience. What do you guys think? Questions in education? Economic development? Yes. Now, my name is Tommy Blakely, and I have a question for the panel. We've had an excellent discussion the infrastructure and all, but I haven't heard anyone really talk except for Mayor Rumley about quality of life. And I have a personal interest in the green belts. And at one time we had some discussions about a river walk. In some of the cities that I've lived in, including northern Atlanta, I see what a river walk atmosphere can do for enhancing the quality of life. So I'd ask the panel to comment on Greenbelt issues as it affects quality of life. Okay, go ahead. I'd be happy to address that issue. The town of Bermuda Run participates as a member of the municipal planning organization, which the Department of Transportation is organized around regional areas. And up until about three years ago, we had not, I don't think, adequately participated. Since then, we have had three projects approved. 
to help in greenway projects, transportation, and common traffic. Uh, for those of you that uh, are ever up in our area here around the Twin City soccer fields on Saturdays, God bless you. Uh, it's a, a real mess to try to get in and out. But we were able to successfully transform that next summer, fingers crossed, we'll begin building a roundabout that will calm that traffic so speeders coming across the Catherine Crosby Bridge at 60 will suddenly realize they're going to go into a circle. Secondly, there's going to be a sidewalk that will connect that uh, front gate of the Bermuda Run over to the, to the Catherine Crosby Bridge and a greenway project on up into Tanglewood and eventually over to Lewisville. In the second phase, we've got a project that will be started hopefully next year that will run from the roundabout on the north side of 158 down to Meg Brown's furnishings right here in Kinderton and connect over to Kinderton Village, the most recently voluntary annexation of our town. We're in the process of developing plans for landscaping and upscaling the intersection of 158. And we just met recently and had the folks from DOT out to describe our, our comprehensive plan. And uh, Max, uh, uh, Matthew is going to come out. We're going to start looking at uh, bicycle lanes and other ways of enhancing the environment to try to make it more uh, amenable. And we've got some other ideas out here at the river. So I hope that helps. Limiting up quality of life. What do you think? Well, um, we have a, purchased 80 acres along the South Yadkin River. I think the South Yadkin has the best chance of remaining relatively undeveloped, better than the Yadkin yeah, River, no offense. Uh, and we also have a larger fall uh, line there. But um, we're yet to finish our second phase of River Park, which will uh, put in the bridge between the two counties and between the two sides of the river. and finish our river outfitter shop, our zip line, and our uh, trails on the, on the Davie side. I think, though, that the bigger question of, of quality of life has to do with some strategic thinking. If Coolamie wants to remain a little island surrounded by green, which makes us very attractive as a small community uh, with kind of a semi-urban, uh, close-together feel to it, um, then we have to do things to make sure that the land around us is not going to be developed in the same way as, I'll say lemons. Um, <laughs> the, we, we have to uh, have some long-term vision. Uh, I am very much for private property rights, but I want to support people to go back into farming again. I think we have very few farmers in David County. And that means that the land that their children inherit can be developed. So if we want to see it stay farmland, then we need to uh, support local farmers and do things in the mill, for example, in our part, where if one, one farmer, dairy farmer, cannot afford to go into added value and cheese operation, we get up several of them together and have a co-op kitchen and, and a, a business in the mill to do a Kulumi brand of cheese. So we have to think that way, so think strategically about quality of life and not just hope for it. Let's take another question. Yes. Well, uh, sorry, here and then we'll go here. Go ahead. Uh, I was a, I live here in Bermuda Run, and I was a former teacher in one of San Francisco County Schools. Um, I've always heard good things about the Davie County Schools, but I'm very interested in this the whole high school development and have been trying to follow the whole one or two school debate over the last few years. Um, I guess one of the fears that I would have as a former teacher in sending my kids as they come through is the size of the school and making sure it's scalable moving forward. Uh, for example, when Reagan opened, um, it was built to what they expected. They just had to start adding new facilities within a couple of years because they outgrew what there was. Are we looking for the growth factor in this in this one school, will there be space or are we going to get five, ten years down the line and have 40 kids in the classroom again? That's a great question. Uh, 
We have planned for the current population that we have of almost 1,800 students. We do have areas within the facility as part of the schematic design that could be turned into future classrooms. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we can use the facility in the future as we grow. Plus we have identified space on the site right next to the building where we could add a one, two, or three story structure for additional classrooms and connect right into the classroom wing. So that's a great question. Um, I will tell you, moving from Mount Airy as superintendent, where my daughters were attending a high school of 535 to a large school, I had a little anxiety about them going to such a large school. My daughters have loved their experience with the teachers and other students at Navy High School. So we're able to offer a really comprehensive curriculum with a lot of different offerings and, and opportunities for children with that size of school. OK, we have a question here. Yes, good morning. Um, I'm Noelle Brady-Smith. I serve as Executive Director in the Davie County Schools. And I'd like Dr. Hartness to take just a minute and talk to you all about what's happening inside the high school. We have a wonderful opportunity having been chosen to be part of a STEM affinity network. And if you could just elaborate on that a little bit, I think it would be interesting to our audience. Currently we have um, a STEM center at Davie County High School that's serving the first ninth grade cohort that will move into the 10th grade this next year. We were chosen by the New Schools Project that started all the early colleges in North Carolina to um, be a part of a STEM affinity network. So we have a, a cohort of teachers that have been trained in the engineering process of instructional design and delivery. And we have about 135 students in the ninth grade. We'll have another 135 to 150 next year as we infiltrate this new instructional process throughout the school and teach students those skills of team building, project-based learning, and working together to solve issues outside of a traditional deliver from the front of the classroom, take notes and get it. We're really uh, helping our students to, to work together and solve problems together. Let's take one more question before we start to wrap up. Let's go. Let's go. Yes. Hi, my name is Erica Balst. Um, I'm here with Andy Life. Um, we've talked about the new high school. I'd like for Dr. Hartness to also talk about the repurposing plan that's out there, what we'll do with the old facility, and how the repurposing plan can be good for the community. I'd be glad to do that, and it goes back to the quality of life question that came up before. I, I think we've all seen um, buildings across North Carolina that were abandoned after a new facility was built. We have, as part of our plan for a new high school, when the new high school opens, we have plans for the existing high school campus. One building would be used as by our administrative offices. We would demo some of the oldest buildings on campus and make way for a recreational facility that's dedicated recreational use. We brought together about 30 people not long ago and, and had ideas in the visioning process of what can we do with this campus, this other 31 acres, for quality of life in Davie County. And we have multiple options that are out there that the county can consider, the recreation master planning group can consider everything from recreational fields, ball fields, to um, walking trails, to picnic areas, uh, all kinds of different options. So we've laid the options out there, and it's a matter of us choosing what it is we want for the future of Davie County. When you look at the soccer park next door, and you look at charter buses bringing children and adults into this community. These people are staying here overnight, they're eating here, they're sleeping, they're shopping, and I would love to see a similar project take place in Moxville to bring a large group of people in on the weekends and different times for tournaments so that we can enhance the quality of life, not only for us during the week, but for the businesses in and around Moxville. So we do have a plan in place um, to repurpose the existing high school campus once a new school is built. What I like about these discussions, and, and once again, we, we've had another one here in Davie County, is that we have an opportunity to talk about what's working. And it's a reminder to those of you in the room that you have a lot going for you. Perhaps things that you overlook, or perhaps things you underestimate. But they're real obstacles as well. And you've heard what these obstacles are. And you heard kind of perhaps what the pathway is to some of these solutions. They won't be easy. Really will take sort of a concerted community effort to make progress to get a bond issue passed, to get some of this infrastructure built, to get maybe the tax rates figured out, to get a sprawling old mill that's been underutilized for a generation, uh, reborn as something new and vital that creates new jobs. The cool thing about Davie County and about a place like this and you folks being here is it's all possible. It really is possible. Nothing that we 
heard today is blue sky. Nothing is really beyond the reach what you folks are talking about. You don't really need to look any further than Vander Usens and, and that they're staking their future and their dreams in this community, as are major medical facilities. We've got a lot of momentum. We're going to pick this discussion up again a year from now, so we'll see you all back in this room uh, sometime next March. Right now, I would like to thank our panelists, uh, Terry Brawley, Darren Hartness, Ken Rethmeyer, and Lynn Rumley. Thank you very much. Before Doug Copeland comes back to close the program out, I would like to invite up uh, Dr. Joel Edwards to say a few remarks about Devon Health. Does all this just get just give you butterflies in your stomach? To think about the opportunity that we have in Davie County. I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Joel Edwards. I practice at medical assistance at Davie and Moxville. I've lived in Moxville now, uh, in Moxville and Davie County for 34 years, so I'm still a newcomer too. Uh, but uh, I've learned to love the people of Davie County and love what I do. Uh, and this is just an exciting time to be in Davie County. Um, we have some opportunities, we have some challenges. As we move forward in, in health care, we have some great opportunities and that we have two wonderful health care organizations that are investing in our, in our communities in this area. Uh, our editor of Davie County, Davie County Enterprise sort of put it pretty succinctly yesterday. He said, regardless of which hospital we use, our quality of life will take a, will take a giant step forward. Convenient, quality medical care is vital. For us, it will, will be easily accessible. With the opening of the Clements Medical Center, which is a Novant facility, and the future opening of the Bermuda Run uh, facility, White Forest Baptist, we can know that we won't be taken for granted. Both facilities will do their best to deliver outstanding medical care. And to sort of echo what Terry had been saying, the co construction has cost us taxpayers nothing. Uh, and so this is a tremendous boost to our, uh, to our local economy, to our corner of the world, both from an economic standpoint and from a health care standpoint. What I've been sitting around hearing, hearing lately and hearing in this uh, discussion is economic development as well as education. And I think they are, uh, we see very closely, that they are very closely linked. Our healthcare industry is very closely linked to the educational system from which we will uh, garner the best of our students and to, to our nurses, our, our staff, and our, and our physicians of the future. That future is bright in our area. We have some challenges from a health care standpoint. Davie County, uh, in, recent, in their uh, health assessment last year, recognized that we have uh, three primary problems. One is obesity, the second is uh, cancer, and the other is uh, difficult access to food affordable health care. With the things that are going on in Davie County, we're seeing projects, we're seeing move, moves in the direction of trying to deal with all of those others that we have in the future. I want to thank the Business Journal for organizing this event. Uh, recently I had the opportunity to attend another Business Journal event uh, in Greensboro. It was their 40 Leaders Under 40 program, which honored 40 young leaders for their accomplishments and contributions to the Piedmont Triad, uh, as well as their potential for, you know, for, you, for their contribution in the future. There were several young leaders from Novant and Wake Forest School of Medicine who were recognized. As a dad, I was proud my, that my son Ben was also recognized that night for his work in Greensboro and with the uh, Lincoln Financial Group. He's one of the examples of the quality of young people who spring from Davie County. To echo the comments of the panel, though, I wish that my two sons had seen the opportunities in Davie, their opportunities in Davie County and hope that the future young Davie Countyans will find their hopes and dreams here. President Obama yesterday was talking to a group of young Israelis, and he uh, was talking about the issue around the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And he said to these young people, he said, politicians are reluctant to move or lead until the people push them. It's time for us to push too. Thank you, and thank you for being here today. Thank you so much.
much, and um, I want to echo his comments and, ju and Justin's also. As Justin noted in the beginning, we do seven of these panels every year, and I say unequivocally, I don't believe we've ever had a panel where there has been as much discussion about progress that's made and as solid and strategic a vision for the future as what we've heard today. It's, it's really, from our perspective, incredible. I mean, as, as Dr. Ed was talking about, sometimes you can't see, you know, what's so close to you. But for us, as objective uh, folks looking at this, today has been truly an incredible vision of both what has come and what is yet to come. And again, thanks for our panel. Jim and the other Terry who allowed us to bring you into the discussion and, uh, and, and just reach out to you. Thank you all for what you did. Join me again in thanking our panelists, no, I mean our sponsors, Novant Health,